Hello everyone, welcome to Rubonus Podcast. I'm the host Natas Rubonas and I'm joined by my colleague Iritis Vishnauskas. Iritis, welcome to the show. Hello, hello everybody, hello Donatas. Nice to be here once again. Yep, uh, today we have a lot of topics dis- to discuss. Uh, last week we were so happy about, uh, we were so confident about uh, FS, but now this week we will talk about their collapse. Uh, we had a great game in Madrid, uh, overtime drama between uh, Milan and Real Madrid. Also, um, Inspired by our colleagues Jonas Lakshas article, we will um, show, we will tell, we will describe our, let's say, players who increased their stock this year the most. And as well, we have some other insights about last week's uh, action. And just before the beginning, I want to uh, remind you to subscribe us on basketnews.com YouTube channel and as well as Urbanus podcast on major audio platforms such as Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Pod- Podbean or whatever, whatever you're listening to the our podcast. So to begin with, we actually kind of missed the fact that last week in Lithuania, we had Two great, great coaches, Shona Sisekavichus and Jelko Bradovic, visiting our country and coming to Konas and Latkabilis. And actually, nobody expected that our teams will just will just bust their asses. Yes, indeed. I mean, Latkabilis winning uh, mm, could have been expected at least because Partizan was after the Belgrade der- derby. They won it. Maybe they were a little bit hungover. I don't know. But Jalgiris beating Barcelona the way they did, it was really something unexpected. And um, we know how emotional it all was for Sharas. I mean, he had this talk show on Thursday uh, with a huge audience, then the game on Friday. And actually, Yesikavich just admitted, maybe for the first time I heard him admitting that before the game, he was a little bit anxious and he just wanted the game to start as soon as possible because uh, then you focus on basketball and not all o- on that emotional side of things. But I was so impressed with Jalgiris actually, f- maybe for the first time this season. I-, I know they beat Madrid as well, but it was dif- a different context. And this time, as I wrote on Facebook, uh, Edgar Asulanovas was matching up with Nikola Mirotic for the whole fourth quarter. And there were five sequences in a row on offense and on defense where Edgar Asulanovas just kicked his ass and Ulana was in some moments in isolation seemed like prime Jimmy Butler. Yeah, I mean, he was <laughs> making off the dribble shots. I don't know. Stop I don't know what he ate. End. I don't know what he ate before the game. But you know, if Ulana was could play like this all the time, he would be on the same shelf with guys like Lucic or Kalinic. It's just that Ulana was has like three or four games like that during the season, but then he has a lot of mediocre performances at the same time. But I'm really happy for Jalgiris guys, for Coach Dofts. First of all, I saw that they are without Tyler Cavano, so I really thought, how are they going to defend Nikola Mirotic? They put Jankunas on him in the beginning, and he's just too slow. It's impossible for uh, Jankunas to catch Mirotic in, in the perimeter. I, 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 but I wow. loved Tyrese Rice's uh, tweet uh, the other day, because I think that somewhere Jankunas was mentioned, probably Euroleague posted something about Jankunas and, yeah. and doing having another crazy number of his career and Tyrese Rice was surprised. Oh, he's still playing? <laughs> yeah, he's still playing. He's defending Nikola Mirotic. But it, it was really impressive how this uh, one of the bottom EuroLeague teams still dealing with some injuries played quality basketball against the best team in the league and this once again shows that there are actually no easy games in the EuroLeague. Even ga- teams like Jalgiris or Panathinaikos might have a night where everything's falling for them, uh, where the effort is there, where the energy is there. You saw how Josh Nebo was fighting. All these guys were fighting for every he, single 50-50 ball. He, he grabbed three offense rebounds o- over Brandon Davis' head, and he just dunked yeah. the ball so hard. It was probably the best picture of the game. I mean, because Barca, they were off. They didn't yeah. put enough effort for the EuroLeague uh, game. Jalgiris, they were inspired by probably the best atmosphere uh, we had in Jalgiris Arena. Probably since Charles left, I think. I really. think so. It, it, I mean, it was a full house for obvious Almost reasons. Almost 13,000 uh, people, which is yeah. also great. You know, before we had like a month ago against Unix, we had 5,000 fans. So yes. that's a hu- huge difference. And I definitely understand Charles being frustrated uh, with his players' performance. Um, maybe there is some lack of energy because of the crazy schedule that they have. 
after the Copa del Rey, it's difficult to get back to things and they're sort of grinding wins right now and actually losing some games, not only in the EuroLeague, but also in the Spanish League as they lost against Valencia. Uh, maybe it was the best moment in the season for Schalgeris to face a team like Barcelona because they seemed a little bit vulnerable, but I couldn't imagine an ending like this. I mean, during the third quarter, I was thinking, okay, so Barca's going to have their run. They're up by seven, they're up by five. They're still going to win this game eventually. But in the fourth quarter, Jalgiris just put up like a playoff performance or something like that. I'm really happy for Jalgiris fans, obviously, and for the coaching staff and the players. I know that this win doesn't really impact the standings a lot. Uh, but emotionally, I think it feels like uh, something big yeah we were in the press conference and uh, there's a quite you know thin wall between the press conference room and Jalgiris locker room so yeah. we heard uh, all the you know all all the players screaming shouting and being happy about that uh, win and by the way talking about Barca's schedule before the game again Jalgiris Charles mentioned that they they're on a schedule with 17 games in 35 days and what was very interesting that in the second half it seemed like I was watching football game and extra time you know because Rokas Jokobaitis probably twice he asked for the substitution because he had some muscle strain and behind the bench, you know, the uh, physiotherapist or whatever, they were just helping, you know, to stretch uh, Jokobaitis' uh, legs because he just felt some muscle strains. That's kind of, you know, football player injury, not 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 basketball related uh, stuff. So maybe that, uh, that was also, you know, mm, we have to take it uh, into account. By the way, you mentioned about the show uh, the night before the game. Just for everybody to understand how big Sharas is in Lithuania, you have to know that there were 5,000 people in Jalgir Arena who paid uh, yeah. just to watch the talk show with Sharuna Siskevich. So of course, it was hosted by probably the best host in Lithuania, and we have uh, Justina Sienkevich. Uh, um, I wasn't there, but I believe it was a great, a great, great show. It took probably more than two hours. They had... Uh, um, I know that the after singers. party was until 7 a.m. Oh, okay. <laughs> I don't know if Sharas was there, but... <laughs> Well. I wouldn't be surprised <laughs> if he was because that's not, not the first time I hear that sometimes, you know, before games, Charles had some uh, late night performances. But what was interesting that the next day he was beating big time coaches and teams. So it is difficult when you have friends everywhere, you travel and you meet familiar faces. And especially now when you are coming back home and it's a special comeback, like last year, it was an empty gym. Yeah. Because of COVID, there was no atmosphere at all, and it was just a simple journey to Konas. This time, it was it really looked like something special. I mean, not only that, uh, people paid to see the talk show. People paid to s yeah. are, are still paying to see the um, uh, footage of, of of the talk show. Yeah, and Shara said some interesting things in in, in that show, but um, I cannot really recall right now to quote. But there was something interesting about how Coach. Besic did not want him anymore in Barcelona mm -hmm. when he was still a player about his ambitions to play in the NBA, how he made a mistake in 2004 when he talked with Stefan Marbury after mm -hmm. the bronze medal game in the Olympics and Marbury uh, asked him, when are you coming to the NBA? And he said, I'm still not prepared. And he says, this was my mistake. Mm -hmm. I didn't feel confident enough at, at the moment. So yeah, it was a big week, I would say, for Lithuanian basketball fans. It's just a shame, of course, our colleagues on Lithuanian podcast talked about it a lot, that in Panevejis right now, Let mm -hmm. Kabelis has a decent EuroCup team. Želko Bradovic is in the building and there's this, they still cannot get uh, decent attendance. I mean, they were like a little bit and 1,000 people. people. Yeah. yeah. And it's, we're just talking about Sharas, about huge crowds, about big talk shows, about all this, you know, glamour uh, around him in Kaunas. And there in Panem we have 1,600 uh, it's your hometown. people. It's, m it's my hometown. In the press conference, I mean, it was as tiny as this this room we are having a podcast, uh, probably. And then the funny thing was that uh, somebody stepped on uh, Jelko's chair, uh, let's say, uh, before the press conference started. So 
you know, there were some footprints uh, on the <laughs> chair. And when Jelko came, he just saw the chair and he was like, come on, guys, well, what the hell is this? You know, he, he was smiling ironically. So uh, Letkabli's press officer, of course, he switched chairs. And it was funny because it was like one meter distance between us and Angelko. And then he started his, you know, um, history lessons about uh, about Ukrainian war, Yugoslavian war, and uh, etc. It was it was it, it was uh, nice to feel what partisan players usually feel in the locker room. And what was funny that after that game, it was different. Usually, Jelko is shouting, he's screaming, he's yelling at you, and but that game was so bad that he was just talking, you know, in a normal way. And usually, it's it's even way more scary than just having Jelko shouting. You know, I think they you. couldn't score points for like eight minutes in the second quarter. Or they had a like run. That. To 20 to 0. I couldn't see that game because I was working with EuroLeague uh, that night, but mm. I was following the scoreline and I thought, like, what the hell is happening? And actually, my other colleague was in the other commentary booth uh, covering Letkabel's yeah. game and Dorelikas was hitting three pointers and, I, in the and I could hear him through the wall screaming like crazy. <laughs> I, I, it was something like, I remember when uh, Lithuania played Bosnia and Herzegovina in, in oh. the Eurobasket and there is footage on YouTube of Bosnian commentator about Mirza Teletovic Zaparking. Mm. <laughs> <Everyone> Zaparking. <laughs> <laughs> it was something like that. <laughs> I was thinking, what is going on there? But the scoreline was that Kabul is up by 20, by 25, by 26. What the hell? I'm, yeah. su I'm super happy for Nena Chanak because in he, he's a former captain of uh, Partizan and he was also a head coach for a few months in, in Belgrade. And the next day, mm, it, he was fired like in November, probably very early in the, into the season. And at least I was told that Partizan fans, they were very unhappy with Chanek, the way he was coaching, the way the team was playing. So we're kind of, you know, at least some fans. I don't know how many, if there were like hundreds or tens or just few fans, but they were kind of, you know, booing Chanek. And he left. He didn't have a support from the front office, so he decided to leave. The next day, uh, when he left, the next day he got a call from Letkab, from Jonas Winauskas, uh, I think. Mm -hmm. And now, four years later, he is recognized as one of the best uh, coaches in foreign coaches in Lithuania uh, we had. He's very well respected um, among the our Lithuanian head coaches, players just love him. And four years later, he's just busting uh, ass of Jelko Bradovic and, and Partizan. So I think that he's really interesting up and coming uh, coach uh, uh, from Serbia. And probably it's, you know, for Letkablis, it's a luxury to have him. Uh, he made the cup final uh, finally this season. I think so it should be his last year, to be honest. Yeah. I think he reached the ceiling with Let Kabelis and there's nothing else you can do with this team. You can reach the final of the Lithuanian Basketball League and that's your ceiling. In the Euro Cup, you're performing very well. They were in the cup final. Obviously, you cannot match Jalgiris now that they have Joffrey Laverne back. It's mm. a EuroLeague center with a very strong body. It's impossible for Lithuanian league teams to stop him. So that's it. There's nothing more to do for him in Panevejis. And I think in one of his interviews with Lithuanian media, he said that he's dreaming about Alba Berlin, that he sees Alba Berlin as the perfect uh, uh, organization for a coach. Mm -hmm. So that was kind of interesting to hear from him. Mm. Of course, from the coaching standpoint, it's a good place because they kind of don't care about the final There's results. There's not a lot of pressure. Yeah. You have time. Focus on player development. Yes. On continuity of your organization. But Aito Garcia Renes has brought this culture, the Spanish basketball culture to Alba Berlin, and I think they're going to stick to it for a while, and yeah. especially now that former assistant Israel Gonzalez is doing a great job. Actually, in some of our podcasts, we mentioned Alba Berlin for a few times. We're not going to talk about them as a separate topic, yeah. but I just wanted to say that I saw them against Olympiacos, another Crazy. Great, great win for them against one of the elite EuroLeague teams. And I don't know if we have any Alba Berlin fans listening to our podcast. I hope we do. And they might respond to it. But uh, f from what I'm seeing, like I said, Aito Garcia Renes has brought this culture to Alba Berlin. And it just seems a very positive team. Everything about them is positive. The players are very positive. The coaching staff is very positive. The fans also look very positive people. So I, I'm just sending lots of love to Alba Berlin. If I was a Berliner, I would definitely be a fan. Mm. I'm not, <laughs> but it's a nice team to, to follow. 
Yeah, I mean, we ruled them out from the playoff race, but actually the the way they play right now, the the wins they're getting against big teams, actually they're in a playoff race. They're in a they better are. position than Fenerbahce, for win, example. After yeah. this win, they are. And at home, they it seems like they can beat anybody. Yeah, they're playing. They still have uh, a lot of games to play, and they're playing Basconia away, uh, Barca, Zvezda home, Fenerbahce and uh, FS away, Panaikos at home, and Monaco away. I mean, it's a tough schedule. And and once again, we could say, we could predict that there's no chance that they will make the playoffs, but I just wish them to, to surprise us all as they were doing it uh, all season long. I think for them... Being in contention for the playoff is already a win. Yeah, yeah, big it's already a big achievement. They're ranked tenth right now. I mean, they're matching Fenerbahce and Basconia, who are also on nine wins, but they're exceeding expectations for sure. Yeah, and to finish uh, this up about uh, Jelko, uh, I was doing. Uh, I wrote an article about him the last week. I talked with Zoran Savic, the GM of Partizan. I talked with a few Partizan players and. Um, you know, it's k- kind of we kind of know Jelko Bradovic very well. He's coaching over thirty years. Uh, he he won nine Euroleague titles. He participated in like sixty four titles, and uh, he still manages uh, to surprise uh, his fellows. For example, uh, when he came to Partizan, his idea was to sign all twelve Serbian players, and uh, of course, uh, Savic told him that it's just impossible in Jelko because it's 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 not like. It was 30 years ago when they won the EuroLeague with only local players. And uh, what was funny, that players, they were so surprised because Jelko sometimes, he steps in in the practice and he uh, do some plays like full speed. He he runs through the screens. He he shows how the, their, his players should play and he does it in a full spree, uh, speed. And even Savage said that uh, 30 years ago, I mean, I mean, Jelko has more energy when he had 30 years ago when he was coaching Zoran Savage in Real Madrid in 1995. So, that's just that's just crazy, Jelko Bradovic, and how much love he has for his team, Partizan, and of course for the game of basketball. But he's having a tough time, and it's going to be an interesting season uh, for, for them. Okay, uh, let's start about uh, other big coach we like, uh, Ergin Ataman. Uh, I, by the way, I interviewed Dante Exum last week, and he also said that uh, his favorite moment, or let's say sh- most shocking moment of the season was just sitting here and waiting for Ergen Ataman to leave the court. <laughs> he said that we're just sitting here like for 10 minutes and it, he's not going anywhere. It, I mean. it, it's in when he was ejected in Palau. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so it was a good show. Now he's in trouble. I mean, as I said, they were confident. I mean, we were confident. They won four or five yearly games against good teams. They looked confident. They played great basketball. And now we see this against Basconia, minus 13, against Monaco, minus 22. The statement before these games was that they are gonna going to fight for top four. No brainer. They have home court no advantage. Yeah. After these two losses, I think home court advantage is out of the question. Even though you cannot say it's completely impossible, but it makes it very, very, very difficult. Another interesting thing about Anadol Efes before uh, talking about what happened on the court was uh, still that voting that happened on the current EuroLeague standings, where Fenerbahce obviously voted. Uh, for what benefits them, and Anadol Efes voted for what benefits them a little bit more. And uh, from Fenerbahce's club, uh, there was a lot of disappointment. Then Ergin Ataman actually came out and said that he is a big supporter of Turkish basketball, not only Anadol Efes, and he wants to see both teams in the Final Four, Fenerbahce and Efes, but it was not Ataman voting on this, so... Very interesting, really. I mean, this Anadolu FS Fenerbahce Istanbul rivalry doesn't seem like a real rivalry because it's not Galatasaray or Besiktas with football fans. But things like that add a little bit more tension, I believe, between the two Turkish clubs. Yeah, maybe, you know, Ergin is in a safe and comfortable position because he knows that they have an upper hand over Fenerbahce. If they're kind of derby, if their matchups were a bit tighter, uh, when like like it was before when Fenerbahce, they were uh, a yeah. way better team. Maybe he was uh, talking, you know, in a different way. Now he's kind of, he feels that he's better than them. And why not to, not to help, you know, another Turkish team? Maybe that, that was also but a point. to be fair, we heard Ataman's interviews for the past three or four years in the EuroLeague. And 
he is always uh, talking about Turkey, not yeah. only about Anadolu. He's pushing Turkish uh, agenda. You know, he, he, even after winning the EuroLeague, he started yes. his statements on the live uh, broadcast with some Turkish words, uh, showing uh, disappointment that Turkish fans were not so allowed to come. He like understands and accepts this role that he has right now, not only being the coach of EuroLeague champions, but basically Turkish basketball ambassador in Europe. And he's a good flag bearer. Yeah, uh, yeah. I, I, I'd give a lot of respect yeah. to we, him we for that. We make fun. A, a lot of times we make fun no, of him, but, but these he are also just brings a lot of good things and he deserves a lot of respect. I mean, these the are just jokes and yeah, friendly yeah, yeah, banter. Yeah. For example, my impressions of Ergen Ataman is just friendly. I mean, I, I don't really want to offend him. He's a great, great coach and an interesting person. But now talking about those two games, uh, I saw both of them in detail. And, uh, well, first of all, what happened against Basconia, I, I definitely thought it will not happen again in Monaco. Against Basconia, everything started really well. Shane Larkin was going for the three-pointers record, which he set by himself. He started on five from five, I believe, and they were leading at a halftime by seven. It didn't look like they are in trouble, to be honest. Uh, however, that... Defending in the second half was terrible. Below par, I would say. They couldn't control Wade Baldwin at all. They were always allowing him into the paint, driving to his right, right uh, hand, and a lot of easy points for Basconia. Three-pointers in transition. Gedraitis shooting from his sweet spots. Costello and and all the other guys. Even Rajeste was killing them. Even Sander Rajeste, he had 11 points in the fourth quarter. For the young Estonian, it was his best game of career so far. And um, FS had trouble because of their centers. Um, they were all on four fou- both on four fouls, so Ataman had to trust Petrushev once again. And Petrushev, again, when he's on the court, he might give you some points from pick and rolls. But then on the other side of the court, the opposition is so happy t- to see him and to attack him. And in pick and roll action, he cannot defend right now. I mean, he still needs to grow up as a as a basketball player in the, the men's game in the, in the Euroleague, which is which is normal, yeah. But the way is the thing is that, for example, when you have Shane Larkin on the court and all the pick and roll defense was also terrible. I mean, I can understand young guy like uh, Petrushev. Uh, he he still has a long way to go. But Larkin, it was it was disrespe- disrespectful for his team. Uh, as well. I mean, the way they were playing FS, uh, the way they were playing, especially against Monaco, it was just disrespectful for the name of the EuroLeague champion, disrespectful for FS fans, and especially disrespectful for their opponents. I mean, Rajasta, mm. he was he was killing them because uh, he was spot g- getting up shots. Uh, spot up shots. open spot-up shots. And when you see how Shane Lark and other players, they're going for the, uh, let's say, defensive rebound, all these teams, they were uh, out-rebounding uh, FS uh, very very badly uh, especially in 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 monaco game and i have like two they don't care stats uh in put um, in putback uh, points fs allow allow most putback points in the euroleague almost seven per game and we're talking just about putbacks not second chance points uh check second chance points but Mm -hmm. only putbacks in transition points their first uh, worst uh, in transition points allowed in euroleague uh, almost 11. that tells a lot about the effort they put and actually they don't put on the court. Well, as I said, after what happened uh, in B- B- Basconia, I, I thought that they will not be that bad on Friday in Monaco. I mean, okay, it, it was just one off. It happens to another FS. We know that they sort of have this NBA regular season type of approach even though I don't accept that in the EuroLeague you can approach this like NBA regular season with 82 games where losing a couple doesn't hurt you. But it is what it is for FS. They are like that. Sometimes they want to play, sometimes they don't. But after such a terrible performance in in, um, Vittoria, I wanted to see a response. In Monaco, it was even worse, actually. Mm -hmm. Shane Larkin had his worst, worst career night, zero points. He was not on the court for last 15 minutes of the game, I believe. Ataman was so frustrated with him. Yeah, I was and even told that there was something, you know, verbal conflict, conflict between Ataman right. and Larkin, which is quite understandable and when your main guy is having that kind of night. One stat that tells me a lot, actually. Monaco scored 102 points with only 18 assists. 
which means the one-on-one -on -one defense in this game was as bad as it gets. They were always allowing Paris Lee to his left. They were always allowing Mike James to his right, to his left. He, he was basically doing whatever he wants. Dwayne Bacon, who is not known for his ball distribution, had the luxury of making career-high seven assists because it was so easy to make a lap for Donta Hall or, or anybody else in this in this particular game. So the one-on-one -on -one defense, the individual defense in this game was shocking. Yeah, second chance point, uh, points, 18 to two, uh, points of turnovers, 22 to four. I mean, that's... And the worst thing is that after two quarters, you're already down by 11. And Ataman in the interview says uh, those things that you can expect, I mean, and second chance points are a big problem for us and individual defense yeah. and in the second half we will try to be more aggressive they were even less aggressive in the yeah. second half and he was very right saying that we are just walking on the court yeah but i didn't see any reaction not after not only after Bascona's game but uh, at the same time in the second half and it, it's it's just really surprising i just thought that after winning the cup they kind of regained the momentum, regained yeah. the co uh, focus, and they were playing more or less like, you know, something like that championship team from the last season. But j this game showed, uh, this week actually showed again that FS, they're just unpredictable, and it's it's very tough to, to trust them. I mean, when you're defending like this against a very talented Monaco team, it makes Alpha Diallo look like Kawhi Leonard and Mike James like Damian Lillard. <laughs> and you cannot do anything to stop them. And another thing, obviously, is not only they lost the game, <laughs> they lost the points difference to a team that is really close in the standings. Monaco uh, lost in Istanbul by 21. And after the game, when they won by 22 eventually, Mike James admitted that um, usually before the game, uh, in, in, in the second part of the season, if they lost the first head-to-head, -head, he's checking the points difference. This time he didn't even bother looking because he thought like in Istanbul we lost by 40. And three minutes until the end of the game, he realized that we cannot, we cannot only win the game, but we can also take the points advantage on Anadol Efes. And to me it seemed that Ergin Ataman actually didn't know this as well because when there were five minutes left in the game, Vasa Mitic made an end one play. Uh, he made a free throw and he was substituted uh, by Tuncher. And also Boba was substituted by Balbay. And this is me thinking that this, this it's is the white, white flag. flag. It's a white flag. <laughs> well, the game is over. Now yeah. we're going to have those trash minutes. But after a minute, I believe it was like 18 point game or 20 point game. Mm. Vasa Mitic is back in the court. And he's again playing with his uh, strongest lineup. <laughs> so Ergen Ataman, maybe he realized himself, maybe the assistant coach said to him or one of the players that, look, obviously we're losing the game, but let's still focus on this points difference. And in the end, they even he lost that. Somehow fouled my James on a shooting three -point a three-pointer. It's just... And he made all those things clutch free throws. ended up terrible, but I have to say that they deserve that. They deserve that uh, kind of outcome uh, of the game. And it was also funny hearing Sasha Bradovic for Monaco. It was their 11th victory. They're very close to the top eight. And um, first of all, he said that probably this was the best game for us uh, so far this season. And I agree with yeah. that because I saw effort on defense. They for the first time, actually, I saw Monaco really defending as a team. Yeah, and they, they managed to keep the intensity for all 40 minutes. Yes. I didn't see any breakdown of their game. We know that offensively they have enough talent, mm. but uh, the defense is the big question. And in, in this case, they were defending very well. Obviously, they didn't stop Vasilya Mitic, but who does? Nobody stops him. But the other guys were sort of locked and couldn't do much. So another thing that Sasha Bradovic said is like, okay, so... Now we have 15 wins in the EuroLeague, but four of them don't count, so it is still very difficult for us, but we're gonna dream about the top eight. <laughs> it, it, it's, true. it's true, and it's right. so painfully true, because <laughs> if we calculated all these games against Russian teams, they were fifth in the standings. Now now they are ninth. It's, yeah. it's just it's just incredible, and it's, it's, it's sad for Monaco, but at the same time, I'm I'm really happy for them because they deserve that victory, uh, as we already said that they fully deserved it and they played amazing basketball. And I was kind of you know concerned when Zvezda won both games. Uh, I was kind of concerned about uh, Monaco's mm. selection for the top eight because FS they were playing really good basketball. But now it 
Once again, as I said, Monaco, they were playing probably the most solid basketball after FS uh, among these uh, playoff teams. So they just proved that Man, on the court. You cannot even imagine how much I'm cheering for Mike James. Uh, I, I always emphasize that he's my favorite player he in the EuroLeague. Cooking. He was cooking that He night. was. Not only that night. I mean, ever since Sasha Bradovic came in, he, he is performing to his level. But Except uh, from some late uh, game situations. Some decisions, right? But yeah. you're you're taking yeah, like yeah, I know, yeah, single plays. But I'm mm -hmm. talking about his performances in general. And the funny thing is that uh, it was Friday night. I was watching Jalgiris, and it was halftime in Jalgiris game. And I got a call from uh, one of my bosses, let's say, and he said, "Like, look, man, uh, there's a problem. We don't have a commentator for Monaco FS game." It was about to start, like in 15 minutes. Okay, I already had a can of beer, like. <laughs> open <laughs> and he's saying to me are you gonna make it and i'm thinking about my options i can easily say that like i had a few beers i'm not available mm. at the moment i'm at home whatever i can i i can't and nobody could blame me but then my second thought was damn it's mike against fs good game i'm i'm, I'm i'll be there in 10 <laughs> was my response yeah, that <laughs> no I did, I did not i never have any alcohol before broadcast is very unprofessional so uh, <laughs> i just put the can away back in the fridge and i said to my girlfriend mike needs me <laughs> i'm going <laughs> and mike didn't disappoint you 27 no, no, points six assists clutch free throws everything full package however do you think that the is now in trouble not about the home court advantage speaking about the playoffs in general or do you think they still have this button again they're gonna click it and this week they're gonna win next week they're gonna win and they'll be safe i don't know i just i'm just mad at them really so unpredictable they, they right act now. like so you, you 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 throw through, through all these you know NBA comparisons. They act like Cleveland Cavaliers a lot of years ago. You know they're just thinking that oh we will just switch the button and we'll be amazing in the playoffs. I don't know. They should. They still should make the playoffs. What's the schedule for them? Do you have it open? Yeah, what they are still they? have six games left. As I said, they, they had a big. Privilege. I think they have a lot of games at home, right? Uh, just one second. Oh yeah, they're playing five games at home in a row after Jalgiris game, mm. sorry, four games. So now pl they're playing Jalgiris away. I'm not so sure about that game yet. They should win, but uh, watching Jalgiris and watching FS, yeah, now you don't know. <laughs> but then they're playing home against Real Madrid, mm. Milan, and Bayern, and then Alba. I mean, okay, Bayern, they had some COVID issues and that's really bad. It, it they might have ruin, their game postponed right yeah, now. Yeah, and that might yeah. actually kind of ruin their end of the regular season mm. because if they if it will take them out of the rhythm, I mean, it's going to be really hard to, to get back with four weeks left until the end of the regular season. So and then they're playing Zvezda away. So you think FS should still be the number five seed or number six mm. at least, right? Sure. I hope, I hope, I really hope. Do you think that that like what happened with Shane Larkin in Monaco and if there was a conflict with Ergin Ataman this spices things up a little bit more with those Real Madrid rumors I mean Shane Larkin with his body language he looks doesn't like look very happy right now yeah he looks like he is already thinking about his uh, flat so in Madrid so if there's an agreement some apartments I don't know if, I don't know. if there is an agreement then it affects the player obviously it because should. It how should. can how can Shane Larkin be on zero points in a yearly game even on bad and days he at least hits a couple and you know he if he has an agreement he kind of put himself in a comfortable situation you know he he has kind of nothing to lose okay this this uh, season you know kind could end up in a kind of disaster but then when you know that you have a good deal with real madrid and you're going to spain the next year that's not a bad option. And if you want to end the season as quickly as possible, if you hate your coach, if you're kind of uh, tired of your teammates, maybe he just doesn't care. I don't know. I mean, Shane Larkin is, is an amazing basketball player. Yeah. It's, it's not like he's going to lose his market value because of a few bad bad games, but it's just, it, it affects the team, obviously. The team, f to win games, they need Shane Larkin delivering, as well as Vasa Mitic. And, we see far too many games this season where only one of their big players performs well. Mm. Uh, I believe you talked with Eric McCollum when he said that in, in EuroLeague to win a game, mm -hmm. you need at least three players performing very well. Yeah. Two sometimes is not enough and one is definitely not enough. So Vasa Mitchis in Monaco, he was doing all that he can. There was just no help.
Mm. Yeah, so as I said, even the opponents of FS, they kind of watch Larkin play and from his body language, from the level uh, he was playing playing recently, recently, especially the last week, they kind of feel that he's, he's thinking about Real Madrid or any other team or anything else which kind of distracts him uh, from performing as best as he can and as we know uh, how he can play actually. So it's disappointing, but it, you know, it's it's not the first time, even if there was some arguments about uh, between him and coach, probably it's not the first time that when players in their mind, they hate coach Ataman. I mean, they went a lot uh, through a lot of uh, different difficult situations, even the last season. So it shouldn't be something very, very important uh, for their mindsets uh, towards the uh, Euroleague journey. But they're just disrespecting the game of basketball with the game they're playing right now. And they should do some, 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 some things about that. Okay, uh, let's go with the game of the week. Probably we can call it the game of the week. Real Madrid, Milan. Three minutes left, uh, with three minutes to play in the end of the regulation. Milan were uh, up by seven. Uh, fans were unhappy because they thought that Real Madrid, that bad stretch, is going to continue. I was surprised watching some females uh, cursing referees and thrashing them. It was it was a fun, fun thing to watch. But somehow they managed uh, to survive. What would be your, let's say, key moments uh, from that game? Well, key moments, I would say that we saw the good and the bad from Sergio Yur. Uh In crucial moments, he carried the team. Then during the overtime, he almost buried yeah. the team. Also, I think it was like the first really good big performance for Gabi Dex since he came back to the EuroLeague. Um, it was a very physical game but at the same time. A lot of experience on the court from both sides. I think, well, let's be clear that Milan were lacking players. Um, they they had, were lacking. They had no Chacho Rodriguez. Floor general, because we saw how difficult it was for and Delaney. Delaney had a bad game. Delaney got tired in the end. He, he actually admitted himself on Twitter that it was a bad game for him, back to the gym and working on, on his shooting. Uh, but they were still always in the game. As you said, in the end of the fourth quarter, they were actually in control. Then in the overtime, it seemed like Real Madrid is going to get away with this easily, but Sergio Yul ma made some bad decisions. Milan had a chance to come back. Devon Hall hit a free. I don't know. I mean, for both teams, it was an important game. I don't think Milan should be disappointed with the way they performed on the court, knowing their issues, the injuries. A player like Alviti, for example, stepping up was huge. And Messina should not be disappointed with his team. But at the same time, I think it's uh, such a big relief to Pablo Lasso to finally get a win. Because the background of the game was also that uh, they lost in Belgrade, as I predicted. They lost to Cervena Zvezda. Mm. And before the Zvezda game, Marca spread those rumors about Pablo Lasso being on a hot seat. So they definitely needed this win badly. They got it. It was... Not very convincing performance, I would say, but the most important thing is a win at this at this point of the season. Yeah, and a lot of uh, fans they were talking about Sergio Yu. Of course, he was amazing. Uh, I think that he scored uh, eleven points uh, both in the fourth quarter and the overtime with some nasty and very important shots uh, at first to tie the game and then to to build uh, some lead for Real uh, in the overtime. But what I actually loved was Real defense and especially starting from Gabidek, then Gershon Yabuselli, and uh, also Vincent Poirier. I Let's mean, not forget that Tavares was ejected from the game. Oh yeah. So, I mean, that that was hell of a defensive effort because I think that in the last eight minutes of the game, Milan scored only seven points. And as I said, you know, they were missing a floor general like Sergio Rodriguez so much because Devon Hall, they just they just locked him down in the end, although he's a very solid player on a very solid season, but he, he, he had a very hard time. Although I think that underrated moment of the game was in the end of the regulation uh, when Davide Alviti, he came for kind of dunk, probably it was dunk. The block? You mean? And yeah, I think mm. that was a clear foul. And it seems like the you know Greek witches from the last game in Athens, <laughs> they were kind of punishing, you know, uh, Milan because Milan, they were down by two. They were 12 seconds to play in and 
I thought that it was clear foul by Vincent Poirier. Maybe. I don't but, know. You know, I mean, Poirier was going for the ball, but it might have been a foul. However, um, if I had you, screenshots, uh, it was clear foul. Yeah. But in the crucial moment of the game, your problem for not getting a call is not n- showing. That no, is being David Elviti. Exactly. I even have a note that he's too shy to show everybody that uh, that was a clear foul. If he, you're Nando Decolo, no if you're Nando De Colo, you're selling it. If you're Rudy Fernandez, you're kind of injured. Well, you know, these days Rudy moment. Fernandez does not go for layups. <laughs> <laughs> okay, <laughs> maybe De Colo is yeah. a better example. Uh, but you're David Elviti. You don't have any authority, and you're you're and you're he just didn't ha- show any emotions yes. after that. No play. reaction at all. No yeah. reaction. So my initial thought was a uh, clear block. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But then after I, the I replays, sho- I watched the replay. You might see the foul. Yeah, yeah, yeah. From the all the angles. Yeah. So it was kind of underrated moment of the game. But for Real Madrid, it was an important game. However, I, I mentioned this was the game. And uh, Zvezda did what I predicted. They won both of their home games uh, this w- last week mm-hmm. against Real Madrid. And as you could have expected against Maccabi, even though it was not that easy against Maccabi, but against Real Madrid, it was a very ugly game of basketball. <laughs> it was so so hard to um, uh, commentate the game and to actually focus on the game. It was not pretty, but I expected it. Like this because uh, Real Madrid was in a bad moment. So when the they win because of their fighting spirit, the hustle, and the that's de- their style. The, the defense, no? that's their style. They're grinding games. Um, I mean, they could have actually lost in the end because Real Madrid started hitting big shots. That here you saw sort of remember that he's one of the most clutch players, maybe behind Spanulis only in the last decade, but. In the very end of the game, you could not make the winning play, and Sirvenas was the got this very important win, which puts them number eight in the standings right now. Obviously, the Maccabi win puts them there, but the Madrid game, I think, was more difficult. And well, last week we had our predictions. Does your opinion about Zvezda being in a playoff change after after this? Mm, I really like them. Uh, I just don't know who to throw out. Uh, for sure, I don't have Maccabi in top eight. Well, I was throwing out Monaco, but mm-hmm. since they beat Anadol FS by 22 points now, it's um, so unpredictable. Maccabi is going down. Let's agree on that one. And yeah, and probably we already discussed that Bayern, they were in a tough schedule. And now with COVID no. taking this play, it might be really hard for them to save their, mm-hmm. to keep their position in top eight. So. It would be very sad, actually, because they improved throughout the season. And they were playing quality basketball. All the injured players were coming back. So it would be pity if, mostly because of this, mm, their season ending would be impacted by this. But, you know, EuroLeague is... Uh, it's, 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 it's very tough beast. At the same time, you know, with Russian teams in, nobody knows if Bayern w- was in the mix for, for the playoffs. So mm. it is what it is. My sen- my five cents uh, for the Euro- last week's Euroleague action goes to the decision which was taken off the court, actually, because probably a lot of people missed this out, that um, Fenerbahce and, and the Maccabi game was rescheduled, right? And it was rescheduled to April 13th. The end of the regular season is April 8th. And we have playoffs in April 8, 19. So basically, we're talking about now Maccabi, they're in the playoffs, and Fenerbahce, they're chasing that position. Mm-hmm. And basically, we're talking about the scenario where with all these teams in the mix, I mean, between fifth this and This game might be the decider. For a lot of matchups in the playoffs. <laughs> it might be the decisive game. And it might be decisive games for both of these teams, but at the same time, for the playoff matchups. Yes. So if I am Barcelona, Real Madrid, and I am seeing this situation where I don't <coughs> know who I'm going to play against with six days to, to left uh, until the playoff mm. start, I'm pissed, really. I mean, it goes according to rules because in the regulations, it was said that games might be rescheduled yes. no later than April 14. And, you know, having this COVID situation, it's kind of logical to give more space and more windows. But at the same time, you should give all these windows before the end of a regular season. And Maccabi and Fenerbahce, I completely understand them. They want to avoid having uh, two games in a week and 
postponing this game uh, in a situation where you will have to focus only on that game, not for a long trip, let's say two, two away games in three days, it's, it's of course it's good for them, but for the league, I'm not so sure if it's good and if, if it's fair mm. for these top seeded well, teams. Well, it brings a lot of uncertainty. I, I agree with you, but uh, these COVID postponements is such a force majeure Ooh. situation that it's kind of becomes too difficult yeah, to put all the games in the calendar but before had, the deadline. But they had a couple of windows, you know, to reschedule it later. But I I didn't really think about that actually. Yeah. Now now only that you that you've mentioned it, I realized. The of situation, course, if for example, it's it's very realistic that both Maccabi and Fenerbahce, this game might be might have no point at all for the uh, playoff uh, mm -hmm. classification, for example. But you know, if not, if four teams in the it will be in the mix and one one game one win will decide not only positions uh, in the top eight but also the actual playoff teams, that's that's just crazy. Okay, and let's go with the last part of our podcast, right? all these uh, our top selections for players who improved their stock the most uh, this year uh, who would you go with who would you start with well the first name that i want to mention is modulo i already talked a little bit about alba berlin and modulo is finally becoming consistent and the level that he's playing in right now makes him an attractive option i would say to the very best EuroLeague teams. This last performance against Olympiakos last week, what a night he had. He looked unstoppable. He has basically all the skills, playing one-on-one, -on -one, playing two-on-two. -two. He improved his decision-making. Now he looks more mature than, than he was when he played for Bamberg or, or even Bayern Munich. He's having his career season. His numbers are amazing. His two-point shooting percentage is 52. Three-point shooting is 46.5%. Um, he's adding some more assists to his game. He's scoring almost 14 points per game. He's a combo guard that is very difficult to guard, to defend. I mean, mm -hmm. when when he's having a night like this against Olympiakos, you can put Dorsey, you can put anybody, walk up on him. No one's, no one can stop him. He is playing at a very high level right now. And uh, I don't know his contract situation with Alba, but if he's a free agent he could have some lucrative offers in my opinion yeah what's interesting that he never played outside germany and he played for all the big german clubs Bamberg, in euro Bayern, and alba uh he is almost 30 years old 29 he is 29 29 right he signed a two-year uh, extension uh okay in last summer so his contract uh, was extended until 20, uh, 2023 but if he would be a free agent this, this summer definitely his value especially when increase you know twice how tough the point guard market is in the euro i wouldn't even call him like a true point guard he's like i said a combo guard but it depends on the coach what he needs but at the same time how many true point guards we I still could, have i in could the see model law on many many euro league teams oh, yes. actually oh yes i could see him on many euro league teams as an improvement actually so the main question was always when uh, his name popped out in the discussion between the GMs, if he can be consistent, because the consistency yeah. was the problem. This year, he's very consistent. For the first Alba. time in his career, he's yeah. having a very consistent season. And when I'm thinking about the teams he could improve, for example, Maccabi, adding more law would be an improvement, oh, yes. in my opinion, because they were kind of disappointed with Keenan Evans, with Cameron Taylor and some other signings. And more law playing at this level would complement Scotty Wilbekin a lot. So there's just one, one option. But this is the first name that comes to my mind, actually, when we're talking about these uh, players that increased the, their value. Yeah, we can, of course, we can talk about all these players like John Brown, Lorenzo Brown. We already praised them enough uh, during the season, so probably this time we will try to uh, throw a some bit. other names. Yeah, and I would like to start uh, with uh, another guy who for sure deserves some credit. Uh, it is uh, Alpha Diallo. Uh, he's averaging almost 10 points per game on 38.3 points, shooting uh, 4.6 uh, rebounds, including 1.7 offensive rebounds, uh, 1.8 assists, 1.3 steals, and almost uh, 12 uh, performance index uh, rating. He's fourth best in Monaco per plus and minus. 
And uh, what was interesting that uh, offensively, when he's on the court, Monaco scores almost 12 points more per 100 possessions uh, when he's not playing. But the main thing is that I was so surprised uh, to find out that he is getting only 160,000 euros for this season. Uh, it's a bargain deal. It's a steal for sure. He's one of the lowest paid Monaco players. And I thought that maybe it was also impact because if you remember, he signed with Panathinaikos. Probably it was a three-year deal. But at the end, Dimitris Priftis, when he got the job in Panathinaikos, he wasn't a fan of, of Diallo. So he, somehow they managed to cancel the deal and he became the free agent. And I thought that maybe it was because of this, that you know it was a late summer uh, signing and that's why he uh, was signed for only... 160,000 euros per season. But it seems like it's not because from what I've heard that the deal with Panaikos is was is, was also some something under 200,000 euros. So it's a steal because the way he's playing, especially uh, the way he can play in defense and how he impacted um, defense, especially in the game against FS, for example, with a lot of deflections, steals. He, I think that he had a career high game against FS. It, he scored some... Something like Olano was, you know, 16, 19 points, but at the same time grabbing a lot of rebounds, something like free steals, free assists. He was all around uh, uh, performer that night. And the best thing is that he is still 24. It was only, it is only his second year in Europe. Uh, he came from Lavrio uh, last year, and he could be a perfect role player for any top eight team and probably any top four team. For example, Barcelona. They have Nigel Hayes. I could see uh, Alfa Diallo's improvement in that situation. Uh, Milan, maybe, okay, they have Siobhan Shields, sorry, no Milan, but for example, Olympiacos, even on Adolo Efes, they would benefit benefit from having player and role player uh, as Alfa Diallo is, who is not requir requiring uh, balls. Yes, you could replace veteran James Anderson with Alfa Diallo. Yeah, that and the only issue, and for sure it's understandable, because he's still very young, but if he's... Uh, if he has a better coach, or I would say coach who puts him in a role, more defined role, like just stopping him having all these off dribble shots or stop playing ISO situations because he can he can be way more efficient, even though he's already efficient, but he if he will find himself in more efficient spots, then he will be even better. So I really believe in this guy. He's also a good uh, guy off the court. So he has a bright future. And uh, yeah, Monaco, they should extend so, him for sure. So his next contract, what would you expect? Half a million, 400K? At least Something 400K. Like I, I believe that it might start, if, if some teams will come in the mix, it, it will start from 500,000 per season. Right. I'm going to talk about the big guys right now because we were talking about guards, forwards. Um, so let's talk about the big guys. I have two very different players that I believe increase their value and uh, could attract some attention. Well, first of all, obviously every EuroLeague team, whether it's small market or big market team, they're craving for a stretch big, stretch four or stretch five. Every team wants to have at least one that type of player on their roster. And one interesting player, an up-and-coming player, is uh, Matthew Costello from Bosconia. Uh, he didn't start the season particularly well, but his performances after the new, new year and also in December were great. Um, he healed from the injury, he came back, and then he started playing amazing basketball. And I saw a lot of performances, not only in the EuroLeague, also in the Spanish Liga Endesa, which is very competitive. And some of those games, you can value, value them as well as the EuroLeague games. He put some double-doubles. He, he is a decent player in the paint, but at the same time, his ability to stretch the floor makes him a very attractive player on the market. He's a good shooter, and he also is not afraid to be a little bit more physical. He had a couple of double-double performances in the Euro EuroLeague already. Basconi is not having a very good season. However, Matthew Costello turns out to be a pretty good signing. You could compare him to Achille Polonara, who also had a great season in Basconia, increased his value, and then signed for Fenerbahce. And Costello right now, he's putting numbers like 9.3 points per game, 5 rebounds per game, uh, almost a block per game. When I saw him for the first time in the EuroLeague, I thought that he is not, he's too soft on defense. 
Mm-hmm. But eventually he figured it out and he doesn't seem like he's so vulnerable defending and even protecting the paint. So a stretch four, a stretch five, he can play both positions. An interesting player. He, he reminds me a lot Tyler Kavanaugh. Uh, actually, they're both 28. They're coming from island teams. Uh, Costello played in Gran Canaria. Kavanaugh, he's coming from Tenerife. Yeah. Um, they're both uh, stretch fours. They both had a kind of uh, difficult beginning of the season. You mentioned all the drawbacks of Costello. It kind of fits to Kavanaugh, and he improved a lot uh, during the season. He's uh, also a really great guy, and yeah. They're 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 very very similar players. They both play in the NBA before for mm. for some stretches. So Costello has uh, Ivory Coast nationality. He played yeah. for the Ivory Coast national team, which is interesting. That's a big advantage for him uh, to stay in the ACB. And he is on the same court with Alec Peters. His jersey number is twenty four. Alec Peters is twenty five. They both mix them they up. both have a beard. <laughs> Sometimes it's impossible to <laughs> to f- figure out. Who's who? <laughs> yeah, actually, they, they should. The they should um, because they love both love to pick and pop. They should I mean, sell <laughs> one of them. I mean, because they're just too similar. Both, uh, you know, yeah, the way they look and the the way they play. Actually, yeah. But shout out to Matthew Costello. He's a really good player. I, I have Chris Jones. Uh, he's a second year Euroleague player, uh, and everybody when it takes uh, Villarban team, everybody is talking about Elio Okobo, how great offensively he is, and for sure I agree with all these uh, good words about Okobo. I would love him. I love to see him in teams like Real Madrid because he's a poor scorer and wonderful player. But at the same time, it seems like for me personally, mm, if we remember Elio Okobo's journey, of course, of course he 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 was injured. He 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 had a injury that ruled him out for a quite a long time. But at the same time. Okobo was not so consistent in the second part of the season. It seemed like teams kind of scouted him, knew how to stop him. Of course, they put more defensive pressure, and it was really hard for Okobo to score. And especially when you don't have so many very talented uh, teammates. It's not like playing in Barcelona or Real Madrid with a lot of uh, offensi- offensive options. But Chris Jones, he he's for sure the most consistent player of uh, Asphalt. And I think that he is... Better in a way that he is more um, all around uh, around player. He is not very good offensively, uh, but he is also very good defensively. And he had only four games in single digit uh, performance uh, performance index rating. He was scoring 13.5 points per game on 37% uh, three point shooting, almost four assists per game, 1.5 steals, uh, 15 player uh, performance index uh, rating per game. Uh, Good body, good hustle for a combo guard in the Euroleague. And I agree that Okobo, uh, he deserves a better payroll. Uh, he deserves more spotlight. But at the same time, Chris Jones, as a player who earned only, uh, who will earn only two, uh, 230,000 euros per this year, he deserves a, a big um, increase uh, of his salary. And I'm talking probably about uh, 500,000 euros uh, per year for the next season and I would love he- to have him next to uh, uh, scorers like Wilbekin, okay, he played in, in Maccabi last year, it wasn't a good fit but the style he's bringing on the court fits to another scorer, uh, for example Shane Lark and, and I don't know Delaney will be gone from, from Milan mm-hmm. probably but I mean there are a lot of other uh, scoring guards in the EuroLeague so I, I would like Aswell to keep him, actually, because since Aswell is now serious in the EuroLeague, they're one of the A-licensed teams. But you they want some just continuity. cannot pay their players. Their best paid player is something around 300,000 euros. But do you think Aswell as an organization might grow a little bit, increase their budget? Because of the taxation, it's it's very hard in mm. France, really. Mm, then it's it's kind of sad. You would like yeah. to see some continuity in teams like that. Yeah, and they're lucky with players like Okobo because it's kind of it was kind of a charity deal. Uh, Okobo came to Villarban just because of his yeah. friendship with Tony Parker, and they kind of agreed that it it could be a good place for him to regain his confidence after the injury he had the NBA to you know to regain his stock. And uh, both actually, what is interesting that both uh, Okobo and Jones had interest from the NBA uh, this season, but because of the agreement with as well, they couldn't leave the team during the season. Mm. Right, another player. I, I want to mention, as I said, I'm talking now about the bigs of the Euroleague, 
and I was talking about a stretch four or, or stretch five. Now, a player that you could sort of rank him as one of the dinosaurs in the modern day basketball, the seven foot three type of players. And he's playing for a bad team, let's say, but his numbers are amazing. And you could see him having a role on a serious EuroLeague team is Jorgos Papayanis. He's only 24 years old. He improved his footwork. Sometimes he he's even used in switch all defense mm -hmm. and he can cover the perimeter a little bit, which is crazy for a player of this size. He's scoring 10 points per game and putting 16 performance index per game. These are very good numbers, even though, as I said, Panathinaikos is a losing team. But uh, Panathinaikos, as one of the uh, Greek fans uh, pointed out in our comments uh, on the last episode, don't really have a great floor general playmaker that could actually create opportunities for a center like Papayanis, but he still manages to grab his points and, and his rebounds. He had like an, a game against Unix with 14 points and 17 rebounds with seven offensive rebounds. And uh, usually if you're building a winning team, you want to have different centers. You want to have somebody that can stretch the floor. You want to have somebody that could do the switch all defense. And at the same time, you would like to have somebody that can match up against Tavares and all the other bigs. And Papa Yanis seems like a good option. The, once again, he's only 24 years old. Mm. It didn't work out for him in the NBA, even though he was drafted kind of high. Like he was a lottery pick. I think. He was a 13th pick uh -huh. in 2016. And it was so weird that uh, Sacramento let him go only after his second year. But well, maybe he just didn't fit in the NBA. But so when he signed for Panathinaikos, basically every season he gets better and better. In, fir in first year, he seemed limited. In second year, he improved, but you could still say that other teams should attack him because he's big and not mm. so mobile. Now, as I said, he can even switch, not only protect the rim. So I think Jorgis Papayanis should consider his options. I mean, Panathinaikos is now not in a very good situation to build a winning team. We saw players like Nick Kaledis, like Dinos Mitoglu leaving. Papa Petru another guy that who knows he might might leave so for Papayanis it might be smart to actually explore his options I know he's still very young I mean he will not lose his value in three years time he would be only 27 but maybe right now it would be a good time for him to try himself in a more competitive environment unless Pao comes with a bigger budget somehow with more ambitions and build a better team next year who knows yeah, they should try to keep him uh, as long as possible uh, because they need some good uh, Greek uh, players uh, to compete against Olympiakos. But especially. again, the good Greek players, they have ambitions. Yeah. They, they, don't, they don't want to be in the bottom of the EuroLeague. Of course, of course. Yeah, he's he's a good player. The, the thing is, the best thing is about him that he, as you mentioned, he's still young. Okay, some a lot of teams try to punish, punish him uh, with their guards and scoring uh, over him, especially in the perimeter. But as I said, he has potential. Uh, he's already getting better at it. And um, yeah. I'm and you know another thing? Um, he actually has a decent jump shot. He's not shooting freeze, mm. but I could see him shooting freeze like Brook Lopez. Mm. I mean, uh, his mid-range shot is good. Mm -hmm. he, his free throw shooting is good. So I'm really intrigued to see what will happen with him like three or four years later. Yes. And a lot of depends on him, you know, if, if he's willing to work, if he's willing to put uh, effort to become a better player in situations where he's still not so comfortable. But yeah, for sure, he has potential. Who doesn't have that much potential, but uh, who really, uh, who's really having a great year is Augustin Rubit, who turns uh, 33 uh, this year. Uh, the thing why I have him on my list, uh, I mean, he's pretty well-known uh, mid-level EuroLeague player. Uh, he already played for a few EuroLeague teams from Barberg, uh, Bamberg to Olympiakos, uh, Jalgiris. Now he's in Bayern. But I don't see many people expecting him be uh, becoming such an important part of uh, Bayern team this year. And we're talking about Bayern, who are currently at fifth uh, seed in the EuroLeague standings. And Rubit, he's scoring 10.4 points per game on Efficient, 50% uh, two points and 36% three point shooting, 4.8 rebounds, 1.6 uh, uh, assists, and almost 12 uh, 
performance uh, index rating. His third best score after Lucic and Hillard. His third best in efficiency after Lucic and Hiller. Hillard. His fourth best in by plus and minus. And what is interesting that with him on the court, uh, according to Bibalytics, uh, Bayern scores almost seven points uh, per uh, hundred possessions, and their three point shooting improved by almost eight eight percent, which is incredible. And what is also what tells a lot about Augustin Rubit, what he brings on the court, is that um, Bayern's defensive numbers, they improve by uh, 8.3 points per uh, 100 possession. So uh, he's all-around player who is a very good teammate. I mean, everybody who played in Jalgiris last year, I mean, they just he just proved that he's a very good glue guy in uh, every team. The problem with him was that Jalgiris opted uh, out of his contract last summer. He had the one plus one. His salary was something around 450 euros, uh, as I've been uh, told. And probably Jalgiris looked at him as too expensive uh, to keep for the next year. And then they signed Tyler Cavanaugh. Maybe they, Schiller wanted a little bit different player. So the thing is that um, they opted out of his contract quite late. His agent also left the agency. He went uh, to the NBA. And the market was not really good at that point of the, the summer. Uh, so he signed with Bayern for around 200,000 uh, euros. But for sure, he deserves uh, more. He just proved that he still has a lot to offer on the EuroLeague level. And I can see him providing on a lot of good top A teams. Uh, and the thing is that, uh, yeah, he should be um, four or 500,000 euro uh, player the next season. For example, Monaco, they have Will Thomas. They signed him for uh, almost 450,000 like euros. He's 35 years old. Yeah. And... I can easily see Monaco signing Rubit, you know, to, to play Will Thomas' role, for example, and to, to get him uh, to get his uh, paycheck. I love his ability to pick and pop and to hit the mid-range jumpers very consistently. It's it's so important on offense. Again, another player that can play as a four and as a five. Uh, and I'm really happy for him that he sort of resurrected his career during the last two years because I know Olympiakos fans... Uh, were disappointed mm -hmm. with him. When he played in Olympiacos, he could not deliver. Uh, he probably had some injuries, health issues that stopped him. But last season for Schalgeris and, and this season for Bayern, he's proving a lot. And yes, definitely, definitely a player like this could play for almost any EuroLeague team. I mean, he's tough on defense. He's, he's, he has a good character. He always puts the effort. Uh, I'm actually thinking about the summer market. I mean, there will mm. be so many interesting moves uh, because the situation changes completely with the Russian teams being out and the players freeing themselves from their contracts. For example, a German player like Johannes Voigtmann should have like 10 offers on his table because you need, like I said, stretch players and he's an experienced and proven player. Yeah, I mean, almost any team should go Voigt, for him. Voigtman, and then we have Schengelia, uh, who will become a free agent. Uh, Ife Lundberg is uh, going and to then be on a two-way contract. He will be a free both agent. Both Browns, Lorenzo and... and, and uh, what's his name? I'm sorry. John Brown, yeah. John, I'm sorry, yeah. John and Lorenzo. I mean, the market next summer will be crazy. Of course, right now, it's still a lot of uncertainty. Yeah. For example, John Brown, he had a contract with Unix until 2023, I guess. But I don't see him or anybody in not Russia Not all of these stay. players terminated their contracts. Uh, some of them are just not playing and they're back home, but they still didn't terminate their contracts. Yeah. So you know, you don't know if they will be free agents or not. So. And, and the situation in every Russian team is so different. Uh, for example, in CSKA, we see Nikola Milutinov still playing for them. Will Clyburn probably, he will, he will play for them this year too. And a lot of players already terminated their contracts. We have Unix with Maria Hezonia still playing, uh, OG Mayo uh, still playing, uh, and uh, a lot of Americans like John Brown, who I'm hearing that he might not come back uh, to Kazan this yeah. year. And then Zenit, they're bringing almost all players they had uh, this year, and it seems like they're coming back for the VTB season. So it's, it's, it's very weird, although there are already some rumors uh, coming from a lot of different areas that there's a feeling that Russian teams might be suspended for the next year uh, as mm -hmm. well. So that would be a hell of a game changer because only 
uh, calculating the uh, payrolls uh, they spent this year, it's already about around 40 million euros. That's crazy money. And that will impact the market. That will mm, put a lot of interesting players on the market. Mm -hmm. uh, the salaries uh, should decrease as well. And, uh, you know, it's it's maybe it, it might uh, be better for a lot of EuroLeague teams, but at the same time, a lot of players might go to China, uh, two-way deals in the NBA, yeah. even the Euro like Cup South might Korea. be stacked next next season. I mean, because not all of these good players fit in the EuroLeague. The rosters are limited. Mm. Man, what's Kevin Pangos up to these days? <laughs> <laughs> I have no clue. I mean, he's still in States. I think he's just enjoying his fatherhood and enjoying his uh, free time with his wife. Right. I don't see any scenario how he could come to, to, to Moscow but and probably... Did, did his contract, like, is his contract legit? I have no clue. I have no clue, right. really. Okay. He didn't came maybe, to. Maybe we, he didn't we, come to Russia, so we need he didn't to, pass the medicals. We need to reach out to him, like have a research. Probably he will not talk about his contract matters. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, but definitely a lot of uh, current Euroleague players that are still playing and performing, increasing their value, and they will be dealing with their contract situations in the summer. So, yeah. So. That's all for this podcast. Uh, we can just remind you that we will have some nice games. For me personally, this week won't be as exciting as it uh, the last uh, one was. Uh, to me it is because Ergin Ataman is coming to Konos. Oh yeah. Every time Ergin is coming, it's uh, another show. Uh, so we have Jargris playing against FS and Olympiakos uh, this week. And these big teams will try to avoid losing important points. Uh, from the other games? Greek Derby. Greek Derby, for sure. Although there's no, not a lot of competition between them, between them but Derby is Derby. So it's okay. Then Milan, Bayern. We I, don't know if I it's going to go on. Yeah. It might be postponed as well. Barcelona Zvezda. If it was in Belgrade, yeah, maybe I would look forward to it. But okay, Barca, Palau. they're exhausted. We'll see. We'll so, see yeah. so we'll see. Not the best week, but I think if you're a diehard EuroLeague fan, you will find some games to watch. Yeah. Yeah. So see you next week. Thanks all for watching. Thank you.